Good afternoon and welcome to this month's Health Policy Grand Rounds from the Institute for Health Policy Studies at UCSF. Today we are very honored to have with us Jennifer Grandis, who is the Robert Werbe Distinguished Professor, and she is um, well known. Her biography and other information are available online. If you have a chance to look at it, as her biography makes clear, Dr. Grandis is an accomplished physician scientist who's made outstanding contributions to the field. Today, she's here to talk about some work in a field to which she is relatively new, but it is a field in which she has already made valuable contributions. About 15 years ago, Dr. Grandis published an important analysis of women's academic careers in her discipline of head and neck surgery. She fielded a survey that documented, among other findings, that women earned about 15 to 20% less than their male counterparts in the field. She's here today to discuss for the first time a new and broader study that is using qualitative interviews to dig further into this inequity, as well as many other inequities that impact women's careers in academic medicine. It's an honor for IHPS Grand Rounds to host her and provide this opportunity for an early view of the work that she's been doing on this crucial topic. So I will hand it over to you, Dr. Grandis. Thank you so much, I really appreciate it. So as um, um, you know, Dr. Spetz has indicated, this is really my first time you know, talking about this topic. Uh, and I'm really grateful for um, you know, the opportunity to do so. So let me tell you just a little bit about me and where I come from and you know, work up to why, why I'm doing this. So I uh, went to a small liberal arts college. Uh, I majored in art history and biology. I was probably a closet pre-med. Um, I got very excited by research in medical school, mostly clinical research, but I was really persuaded by my mentors to learn how to be a basic scientist. It was at a time when NIH funding for basic science was significantly more robust than it was for uh, clinical research. So we worked it out. So I took a year off from my uh, otolaryngology training to go on to a T32. It happened to be a T32 in infectious diseases because one of my beloved mentors is an infectious disease specialist. And I got my K award when I was still a resident. So I had a K award, I had a new baby, and I decided to stay at the University of Pittsburgh where I had uh, done my training and was there until I came to UCSF in 2015. So before I came here, I was active clinically two days a week. And now at UCSF, I'm just active one day a week in the clinic. I married my uh, wonderful husband, who I, hopefully some of you have met, uh, Don Grandis. He's a cardiologist. We got married when I was a PGY3, and he was a cardiology fellow. I had my first child as a chief resident, which was a really novel experience since I was the first and only woman in the training program. And then my second child, uh, who happens to be a fourth year medical student here now at UCSF, I uh, had during my uh, second year on the faculty. I wake up every day and I exercise because it makes me happy. I like reading all the time. I also really like to cook and eat. And believe it or not, I like to quilt, sometimes uh, referred to as like a Jewish Martha Stewart, although I haven't gone to jail. And for me, the key to being a physician scientist and a parent and a person with friends and outside interests is I try to accept that I'm just not perfect. I'm not the best mother, I'm not the best doctor, I'm not the best researcher, but the combination has been an extraordinary opportunity and I continue to really value the world of academic medicine, although I've had some really bumpy experiences which motivated me to do this study. So what made me decide to stay in academics? Well, I was really transformed by the uh, opportunity that research could affect so many other people beyond my own clinical practice. That's an idea that Fred Brancati documented actually in men medical students uh, that he published a study in, in JAMA many years ago. But I published early and I saw how the work that I published under the tutelage of my mentors really could make a difference in patients' lives beyond those that I saw in my clinic. It was critical for me to take time off to learn how to be a researcher. You know, I didn't really know that. Mentors have been critical. Uh, uh, <laughs> there's probably not a week that goes by that I don't have an interaction or a contact with a beloved mentor. 
Uh, now my mentors are aging and uh, ailing. And it's, uh, I mean, actually just this morning, one of my college mentors succumbed to uh, metastatic uh, lung cancer. And I was reminded of what an important role she's played in my life. It's never easy to combine career with family, but to me, I never considered anything else. So even though it wasn't necessarily convenient or uh, okay with the people I worked for when I got married and had children, it was absolutely right for me and my husband, as many of you can probably identify. I didn't always get pregnant and have children when it was exactly the right time for us. Some things we don't have a lot of control over. Early on, it was really important for me to not travel uh, extensively. I needed to learn how to be a scientist. I needed to publish and I had two little babies and I needed to be home with them. It is hard to say no, but I've learned hard to do that. And I've also uh, entrusted uh, friends and colleagues, and of course, my husband with uh, the adjudicating opportunity. So if I get an invitation and I'm just not really sure that it's important, I'll say, what do you think about this? And what it's great at this stage of my life is I often now can pass on these opportunities to uh, colleagues and uh, former trainees. And um, it's a really wonderful uh, stage to be in. I have always tried to be mindful of academic promotion requirements. Turns out this is hard as uh, the study that we did, I think documented really uh, in an eye-opening way. I knew that if I was gonna be a scientist, I had to get funded. So uh, um, luckily in, a, in at my liberal arts college, I learned how to write. Writing has been a really important skill uh, in science as well. And at the end of the day, the question that I ask, and it'll be relevant when we come to this study, is why is the research that I want to do important? And why am I the best person to do that? So we'll get to that. So this is just a picture of my parents, Judy and Herb Rubin. They are still very much on this planet. Uh, my dad, uh, when I joined the faculty, he was a a chair and uh, had a dean role in the uh, School of Arts and Sciences. He's now 91. He doesn't really look very different, which is kind of startling. My mom, uh, Judy Rubin, um, uh, her claim to fame is that she's the most famous art therapist in the world. <laughs> and it's true, um, as much as it was kind of hard to see that as, a, as a, her child growing up. And she started her career as the arts and crafts lady on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, which was filmed in Pittsburgh. And uh, I still really enjoy watching old shows of uh, Fred Rogers and uh, my mom on the show. These are our children, uh, Ben and Anna. Uh, uh, ben doesn't walk around wearing a cape and hat anymore, but he still is a very colorful character. Uh, Don and I moved to San Francisco when Ben was a senior in college and Anna was a sophomore, so we abandoned them, but they have followed us here. As I mentioned, Anna is now a fourth year medical student here at UCSF and she wants to be a pediatrician. And Ben, uh, with his partner, moved to the Bay Area when his sister started medical school. And Don and I have the incredible uh, opportunity to, to live in the same city as our adult children and see them on a regular basis and have them not exactly live with us. So it's good for everybody. Oh, and this is uh, this is actually, I, I love this picture. Don would probably be appalled that I'm showing it, but this is us dancing at Anna's bat mitzvah. And uh, when we dance, it's a great source of humiliation for our children. As they say, when Dad dance, it, when um, da I dance, it's embarrassing. But when uh, their father, Don, dances, it's downright humiliating because he really does work up a sweat. Uh, but I show you their pictures just to emphasize how important family has been and is to me and, and how, how I, I heard from the interviewees, uh, particularly the women, how important it was uh, for their careers as well. So moving beyond my own uh, career, um, I was really lucky uh, as I met with uh, the women in the study. I uh, had no problem with uh, getting promoted on time, receiving tenure. I was given an endowed chair without asking for it. I had many leadership opportunities at the University of Pittsburgh. I've been lucky enough to be elected into the elite uh, societies in academic medicine, but I wasn't clear uh, what it meant to be such a unicorn. Um, what was true was as more and more female medical students were interested in careers in otolaryngology, I knew enough to know that my life was different from 
the lives of most women who became surgeons. And so that's really what justified uh, my uh, entering uh, into the foray of uh, gender studies, if you will, because I didn't know how to advise the women who wanted to be ear, nose and throat doctors. So Susan McKinnon uh, 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 most recently was the chair of plastic surgery at Wash U. Susan is from Canada. She started her career uh, um, uh, developing a, um, um, a, a qualitative uh, measurement that is a survey study, 120 plus questions. She surveyed all the male and female surgeons in Canada, then modified that for plastic surgery. Others have modified it for their discipline. And Susan was kind enough to allow me to modify her uh, uh, validated instrument for otolaryngology. This is back in the day before there really was email. So we literally mailed this massive uh, paper questionnaire to uh, all 504 women who were uh, um, board certified otolaryngologists. We matched each woman with two men who were comparable in age and geographic location because most of the other studies, particularly in surgery, were comparing older men to younger women and therefore the conclusions of inequities were dismissed by people who felt potentially legitimately that it wasn't fair to compare assistant professors, young women with more senior faculty or people in private practice who were men. But what I learned, which was disappointing and surprising, was that uh, women enjoyed less career success as defined by compensation. This was re true regardless of whether they stayed in uh, academic practices or went into the community. And really eye-opening for me, the personal cost to the women was significantly higher. They were more likely to be divorced, not have children, express regret about their career choice, or have experienced discrimination and harassment. My message at this time was still a very sturdy girl one, which is keep your eyes wide open regarding implications of your decisions and be your best advocate rather than assume that others will do it for you. This is just some data from the study. It's essentially showing that when we try to adjust income by all these different variables, uh, whether it be professional hours worked per week, uh, the age of the person, how long ago did they complete their residency training, how many hours a week were they in the operating room, and were they in an academic or non-academic practice, and I think you can appreciate that with respect to compensations, the curves do not appear to narrow in any substantial way. And then I thought, well, it's got to be better in academia because there's tenure and promotion guidelines and there are rules and practices. But sadly, that wasn't the case, regardless of whether we're talking about full associate or assistant professors, the men consistently out earned the women, at least in my field of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery. At the time, I thought I had made a difference. And I think it, for a moment, maybe the study did. Um, you know, there I, I, I learned from many people that the article catalyzed their opportunity to have a conversation with their bosses. I know I was able to secure a raise, but I was really disappointed uh, um, in 2019 when Erin O'Brien, who's at um, uh, Mayo Clinic, uh, published a, a work that really highlighted that um, it was ephemeral, that whatever uh, uh, data we published in 2004 were stubbornly unchanged. Another article that really prompted my interest in this area of gender equity was NIH grants. Like many of you, I have served on countless study sections. I spent the past two and a half days serving on a site visit, if you will, uh, by Zoom. And uh, this was really important work by uh, Tim Lay to look at gender equity when it came to NIH grant applications. And I'll just cut to the chase. Women uh, are awarded grants from the NIH in the proportion that they apply. So the persistent inequities that we see in NIH funding has to do with applications. And I'm really lucky right now, I'm serving as a special consultant to the NIH and I'm working with the leadership of the Center for Scientific Review. And we are actually diving into the data from every university, from every department, and we are going to uh, respectfully communicate 
how uh, departments and schools are doing with respect to the gender of their NIH grant applications. We already know there's a tremendous diversity. There are some institutions where half of the applicants are women, and there's some institutions and departments where barely five to 10% of the applicants are women. So we're hopeful that in this era of diversity, equity, and inclusion, that this data will be useful to drive change. What's clear is the NIH alone cannot do this. The key issues from uh, 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 Tim's study, which by the way, are still true 10 years later when they repeated the analysis, is that the total physician scientist numbers are at steady state, but the funded physician scientists are aging. There are more women in medicine, we all know that at the entry level, but there continues to be disproportionate career attrition for women known as the leaky pipeline. And this is just some data uh, showing that uh, who is doing research really hasn't changed in 15 years. The scientists are getting older. And while we are absolutely gender balanced at entry, the same cannot be said for R01 grant recipients. And frankly, it's because it can't be said for R01 grant applicants. So, um, I will show you uh, the data simply later on. There's been a lot of attention paid to the absolute number of women on medical school faculties. If we look at the absolute number, there's some suggestion that there are more women hired. There's slightly more women who are get, you know, compared to uh, years ago, there seems to be an increase in promotion and leadership. But uh, we'll talk about a little later, a very recent study from the New England Journal of Medicine that showed that when we consider the denominator, that is the number of women present in the field, there's been absolutely no closing of the gap over the course of 37 years, which I find incredibly sobering. So since then, there's been practically no progress. NIH grant recipient is unchanged. Advancement of women to senior ranks and leadership positions is unaltered when we consider the total number of women in the field. NIH grants are awarded to women in proportion to their application rate. So what can we do to encourage institutions to accept responsibility for and address this NIH gap, gap, grant application gap? And I'd love to hear from you. As I say, I'm working now with CSR to actually gather the data. The question is, what do we do with this data? How do we use it as a carrot, as an incentive? The NIH is uh, probably not in a position to uh, use it as a stick, nor would it be appropriate. So here's a little bit of uh, background uh, research that I just want to highlight. You know, why? Uh, what are the women's success rates at actually renewing R01 grants? And so this was a study published in the Journal of Women's Health a few years ago. And what these investigators did is they analyzed descriptors of the PI in the summary statements from men and women who uh, submitted grants as PIs. And the language, you know, and I'm appreciating this now as a budding qualitative researcher, the language was different. Men were really described with terms that indicated exceptionalism. They were pioneers, they were leaders. They did highly innovative or highly significant work. And women in contrast were more likely to be described as having expertise and working in really excellent environments. So what this suggested to these investigators that, that for the reviewers who frankly are us, they're our peers, it was just more easy for them to view male investigators as scientific leaders and score their applications better than they did the female investigators, at least when it came to the investigator subscore. So now we get to this particular study. So why is this research important and why am I the best person to do it? So I was, um, as I mentioned, I was uh, the first woman in my residency training program. I was often the only woman in uh, uh, um, around leadership tables as I was growing up. And I think I expected uh, naively that coming to the West Coast, coming to San Francisco, coming to a public institution, it would be a far uh, 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 um, sunnier landscape to serve as a, women, a woman leader. But I was surprised how challenging the climate was for women in leadership at UCSF when I arrived here in 2015. 
And I was uh, troubled by um, the, the relative value that my female colleagues in leadership felt like they were bringing into the institution, their sense that they were not being adequately valued and their frank unhappiness in their leadership positions despite having fought desperately hard to secure them. So I went to Swarthmore College, as did Arlie Russell Hochschild. We were introduced by a mutual friend. And early in 2018, I started meeting with her to get her advice about how to study the problem. As some of you may know, she published some books that were very meaningful to me as I was starting out like the second shift in the time bind. And she was very generous with her time. So we began conceiving of this study. And then in our backyard, uh, our uh, uh, beloved Dan Dohan was, uh, I knew him through my experience at CTSI. And I remember we uh, had coffee at the JCC and he was more than willing to help me. And thank you, Dan, I really appreciate it. And thank you, Marie, for working so hard with me on this study. And so we designed it, we secured IRB approval. My chair was very comfortable with me using my endowed chair funds to support it. And I'll tell you where we are. So right around the end of 2018, as the study was being approved, the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine published this report, which I thought was fairly earth shattering. Um, the essential conclusion was uh, uh, about 46% of women in academic medicine report being discriminated against and harassed. And everybody assumes that that is an under report. So when this uh, study came out, uh, there were lots of uh, opinion pieces published in very high impact journals uh, about the uh, uh, study. Um, it concluded that there were five factors that created conditions for harassment in science and medicine, a perceived tolerance, a male dominated work setting with men in positions of authority and women in subordinate positions, a hierarchical power structure, only symbolic compliance with uh, uh, the, the federal laws, Title VII and Title IX, and uninformed leadership that lacks intentionality and focus. And the consequences of harassment, something that I learned so profoundly doing this study, was a decline in job satisfaction, frankly, withdrawal from the organization. So this is the leaky pipeline. The other thing that was reported and I learned in vivid detail by uh, speaking with the women who I interviewed, when they reported harassment, they really felt unsatisfied, their experience was minimized or normalized, and they found that there was very little action taken and often they were retaliated against. So it's a really uh, challenging system to uh, cope with. This is an earlier study that points out for me one of the subtle but very important variables. Unconscious bias is just that. It's unconscious, we're not aware of it. So Jo Handelsman, who at this time was at Yale, she's now back at the University of Wisconsin. She's really a very effective and inspiring person. You know, she did a brilliant study. They uh, 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 sent the same resume to men and women who were scientists at Ivy League institutions. And half the time the resume was for a person named Jennifer, half the time the resume was a person named John. And both men and women scientists were more likely to offer John the job as lab manager over Jennifer and when they offered Jennifer the job, she was offered less money. Of course, John and Jennifer here are fictitious, but it's an illustration that there are unconscious biases that uh, infuse all of our experiences in life. And uh, this study really points out that it's, 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 it's everybody. It's not just men not favoring women. This is the uh, uh, New England Journal paper that I alluded to uh, earlier. Some of you may be familiar with this. This was published uh, late in 2020. And the conclusions is that over a 35 year period, women physicians in academic medicine were less likely than men to be promoted to the rank of associate or full professor or to be appointed as department chair. And there was absolutely no narrowing in the gap over time fairly sobering. So the rationale for this study is that women scientists and physicians are underrepresented in leadership positions. They experience more discrimination and harassment and they're paid less than their male counterparts. 
the reality is that even with recognition of these disparities and institution of policies and measures intended to mitigate them, like you know, uh, prolonging the tenure clock, the data are stubbornly unchanged. We just don't seem to be making any significant progress. So what I found missing from the literature with uh, Arlie's help um, was the stories. And so the objective of the study that I did with Dana Marie was to record and synthesize the experiences and perspectives of men and women in science and medicine at various career stages with the ultimate goal of accurately describing the current landscape. So I'm trying to close the empathy gap with this study. I'm trying to share the stories of these people. So hopefully we can move from talking about data to talking about human beings. So what I did luckily in 2019 before the world shut down is I was able to travel all over the country. I conducted in-depth, in-person, semi-structured interviews with 52 men and 52 women at 16 academic medical centers around the US. It's actually the number was 54 and 54, but some of these uh, were done in a slightly different way. And so I'm gonna talk about two out, out, uh, products from the research. One is a series, hopefully, of peer reviewed articles. And that's where the 52 and 52 come in. The 54 and 54 are part of a book that I'm working on. So what I really tried to do when I identified the institutions that I went to, it was a diversity of geography, West Coast, Midwest, South, Northeast. I tried to go to both public institutions and private institutions. And I tried to really have a heterogeneity of institutional prestige as illustrated by top tier institutions defined by NIH and US news rankings, as well as lower tier institutions. Newsflash, it's the same everywhere. It doesn't really matter. I tried to enrich the uh, population for full professors and institutional leaders. Fully half of the people I interviewed were full professors, chairs, uh, directors, uh, deans, because I really wanted to understand the long view. What had men and women seen over the arc of their career? About 25% were assistant professors and 25% were associate professors. I tape recorded the interviews, each lasted about 60 minutes. They were transcribed and then I uh, learned how to uh, code the software, uh, to use the, soft, uh, use the software and code the uh, interviews. And the goal was to identify intersections between uh, features of academic medicine and gender or the term that we coined over the course of the study was gender related bad stuff. So this is just to emphasize what I learned. Um, as Einstein said, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about solutions. We spent hundreds of hours identifying the features of the academic medicine ecosystem and the features of gender in order to code the transcripts of the interviews. And I appreciated how much work went into that and how that really has helped our analytical process as we're now producing uh, documents for a peer review and also to uh, engage a publisher. So what we uh, came up with is based on the literature, we uh, developed codes based on the literature, and then iteratively, every time I came back in the first 10 interviews, we went over the interviews and we modified our codes based on what the, the interviewees were saying. So this is just showing you the academic medicine ecosystem codes, mentorship sponsorship, recruitment retention, negotiation, resources, compensation, productivity, leadership, term limits, networking and professional relationships, promotion and tenure and policies. And I won't read all the details of the gender related bad stuff codes. I'll let you look at that. But one of the things I'm gonna to focus today on our first manuscript, which I hope will finally be accepted by the journal. We're actually on our fourth revision, but we focused our first manuscript on mentorship. But one of the things that was really eye-opening to me, although it was in front of me all the time, I don't know why I didn't see it, but basically in the area of retention, women are almost never retained. And there's no data source to be able to document that. 
I'll bet you if we went to our chairs and our deans at any institution in the country, there is not a central repository of retention data. Recruitment data tend to be a little bit more accessible, but what I heard over and over again is that it was very common for a man to get a competing job offer and to have an active retention effort mounted by the institution. Women were less likely to look for jobs elsewhere and they almost never received a serious retention offer from the institution where they worked. So the first paper on mentoring, as I mentioned in my introduction to myself, I think mentoring is a calling. I also think we don't really learn how to do it. Increasingly, we do now. There's now uh, uh, active mentoring training uh, and uh, attention paid to it. But for so long, the old adage in surgery is watch one, do one, teach one. And it hasn't changed all that much since I trained in uh, the late 1980s and early 1990s. But looking at this AAMC data, people always speculate that uh, uh, salary and, and medical school debt are really important in deciding what kind of career to pursue for MDs. And it turns out that's not as important as mentoring. And, I, and my experience would uh, support this as well. This was a really gobsmacking study. This study came out during my interview process. So this was published in the New England Journal. It was a brilliant idea. So we all in, in clinical fields, our residents have to sit for an in-service exam every year. And so uh, in the 2018 in-service exam in surgery, they, uh, I was given online and uh, all of the trainees agreed to take uh, a survey to uh, describe their experiences with discrimination, abuse, harassment, and burnout in surgical residency training. So like 97% of the surgical residents in the country. And it found that attending surgeons were the most frequent sources of sexual harassment, 27% of the time, and abuse and women trainees were far more likely to be sexually harassed and abused by their faculty. So a story, um, I was uh, um, interviewing uh, um, um, men and women at an institution, I'd say within a month after this journal article came out and I was sitting with a chair of a department of surgery. And I asked this person who was a man, what he thought of this article and how, how, if at all, it impacted his point of view as a department chair. It wasn't clear to me that he was aware of the article. What was clear is that it hadn't occurred to him that his own residence had taken part in the study and that it could have been happening right under his nose. And I think that that aha moment for me highlights the disconnect between the peer review literature and the reality of the the day-to-day -day reality of people working in academic medicine. So this is a table of our interviewees for the publication. As you can see, uh, they're very, uh, they're completely matched, uh, uh, male and female. Um, the age was uh, very similar. Um, I interviewed mostly uh, MDs or PhDs. There were relatively few MD PhDs, but some men and some women. And as you can see, the majority of the people I interviewed um, um, were uh, senior leaders and uh, there were significantly more men who held leadership positions and men were far more likely to have endowed chairs. It was a question that I asked. And this, this is consistent with what's been published in the literature. So here are our findings. Uh, women, but not men, reported being sexually harassed by their mentors. Both women and men became aware of gender inequities in academic medicine through their relationships with both their women mentors and their women mentees. Both men and women mentors recognized the challenges their women mentees faced and made deliberate efforts to help them navigate an equitable environment. And both women and men mentors modeled work family balance and created family friendly environments for their mentees. So I want to be clear that the message here is a nuanced message that in mentoring relationships, some very, very good things are happening, but it's coupled with some very painful and fairly uh, toxic events as well. So uh, here's some participant quotes. 
Um, my mentor definitely struggled as a woman, as a new PI. She was one of the only females in our department. A lot of the men there were very successful and had been around the block and had collaborated. So I think there was definitely an old boys PI network. My mentor wasn't asked to collaborate and I don't think she knew how to deal with that. This participant is now an assistant professor with a new baby somewhere else. And she is trying not to recapitulate her mentor's experience in her own professional networking. Participant 80 said, my woman mentor and her husband were members of the same department. She was the better of the two scientifically, but she had a lot of problems and struggled to have a voice that was equal to his. Participant 80, as a graduate student, was told by this woman when participant 80 got pregnant that she should quit, and she did. And she didn't go back to graduate school until she had her three children, and she's had a very successful career, but the um, disrespect and the undervaluing of her female mentor was something that she remembered you know, 50 years later. Some more participant quotes about helping navigate an inequitable environment. Participant four said, I tell my female trainees point blank and participant four is a man. You are going to be held to a different standard. It is especially true for the foreign board trainees these days. There's so much animosity towards the other. That's why I push so hard for my trainees to learn how to present themselves and their work as favorably as possible. A complicated assessment. Participant 46 said, look, there are a bunch of old white dudes that are in charge and you're going to hit some roadblocks when you encounter some of these men, but I'm going to make you the best scientist you can be leads the way. I also talk to them about having a strong network and let them know I'm always here if they need to talk about discrimination or any other hurdles that they might face. So both participant four and participant 46 are men and both described seeing their female mentees being discriminated against and harassed. And other than providing a space where the women were able to talk to these male mentors about the experience, these men were unable to do anything about it. It's not even clear that they tried. Another quote from participant 30, this is a woman. After I became chair, I had a big aha moment. I realized that women would get their first R01 and we basically say, good luck, see you when to come up for tenure. Now we have someone who meets with junior faculty every six months to a year and looks through their CVs to identify strengths and weaknesses. Things like, you're doing great on getting grants, but you're not publishing enough, or you're doing great on those things, but you're not going to enough meetings. Who's gonna write your letters? And that's the thing that affects women the most. So participant 30 was very effectively mentored. She stayed at the same institution from residency through becoming a chair. And she's now a dean of a very successful medical school. How to model work-life balance. Participant 44 said both of these things. My mentor had kids and he was part of everything at home. He would say, I'm leaving to go to my kids game or I can't do this and we have a family vacation then. We used to have an annual retreat and he didn't go to a single one. It always conflicted with his kid's birthday and he never missed that. I think this is a, a, um, a, a, a copy to both times, so I'm gonna move on. Um, supporting women's pregnancies, childcare responsibilities and creating family-friendly workplaces. Participant 46, who was a man, said one of my grad students had a child last year and I paid for her entire leave, even when the university said I couldn't. Life is life, she's a protective person and I want her to be happy. Participant 22, also a man, said, we have women who have children during fellowship and I never make them extend their fellowship. I want our program to be flexible and family friendly. So these are two male mentors using their power to assist their women trainees. Participant 88 said, I walked into my postdoc six months pregnant and I told my mentor, I was advised not to say anything, but yes, I am pregnant. What could I do? He said, it's okay, we'll figure this out. And he was very supportive. After I had the baby, I felt like I couldn't juggle it all. I wasn't doing a good job at home or at work and something had to give. So I took some time off and my mentor was supportive of that. And then he paid me a per diem to help him write grants from home. So this is a woman who really saw and appreciated how her male mentor extended himself to support her ability to have children during her postdoc. And finally, participant 33, 
I try to take an interest in what people are doing outside of work and respect the fact that people have families and encourage them to take care of their personal health and their mental well being. I ask about people's families and some bring their kids to lab. We have pictures of all these kids. One of the best compliments I've received was from a graduating student who said that I'd had five babies in my lab in five years and been supportive of that. For me, that was huge. Participant 33 is a woman. She is a woman who is not married and doesn't have children. And it was very clear she spoke to me about the babies her trainees had. And in effect, this was part of her family too. And I think that allowed her to be genuinely supportive of uh, their family uh, growth as they were training in her uh, research group. Now to the dark side, harassment. Participant 91 said, for example, at one point, he sat down at the desk next to me while we were talking and put his leg up and he wasn't wearing any underwear. I could see his full penis and that could only have been his intention. He also had pornographic pictures up in the office. I just ignored him, but the problem was that he had affairs with other young women in the center where we worked. So when I came along as a good looking 20 something, a lot of people in the center assumed I was having an affair with him too. So this happened to this woman as a postdoc. She's now a senior faculty member and this picture is still very vivid in her mind as she describes it. Post participant 88 said, my postdoc mentor made sexual advances towards me. He and I had a good relationship and he was starting, he started coming to talk to me in the lab when I was the only one there. He would sit at my desk every afternoon for hours and want to talk. And when I was trying to get my work done, it progressed from there to him acting inappropriately when we went to a conference together. He didn't want to leave me alone at the meeting. And then after dinner, he invited me to his room and then pressed a hug and a kiss on me when I said no. Later during the conference, I agreed to have dinner with him and he asked me all kinds of questions about the boyfriends I must have had when I was younger. This is the only woman I interviewed who actually filed a formal grievance. It went through the Title IX office at the university and the committee decided to find him essentially not guilty of sexual harassment because there was no quid pro quo involved. He had to apologize to her and then she had to stay in his lab. And listening to this woman describe her experience of going through this with her postdoc mentor, alerting the authorities, going through the adjudication process and essentially being discounted was really heartbreaking. So why am I still here? <laughs> I love academic medicine. You know, when we discover something in our lab that can help people, in my case, I, I, I do cancer research. It is so incredibly exciting to think about repairing the world that we live in. I love interacting with peers and trainees. And there is the hope that our work will ultimately make a difference. Many of you are probably aware of this article. It's a, it's, a, it's a positive sign that I'm telling you about it. This came out in Nature Communications a few months ago. And as soon as it was published, the conclusion was that uh, individuals in science who trained with men were more successful than individuals who trained with women. There was a dramatic backlash from the scientific community, including Francis Collins, and the article was retracted. We can still ask, why it was published, but I'm very encouraged that it was retracted because there's a time not long ago where it would have stayed in place uh, as um, you know a, a stain on the record of female mentorship. So what do I want you to take home from this talk today? I think consolidating power in, in, in a few people without accountability, it facilitates and it maintains gender inequities in academic medicine. That is a consistent theme. Men are advantaged and women are persistently disadvantaged as soon as we graduate from medical school or graduate school. Policies alone are inadequate and they won't lead to durable change. In fact, the manuscript that we just submitted on promotion and tenure experiences of women, even though all of these women work at institutions where there are written promotion and tenure policies, not a single individual referred to a written policy. When something bad happens to you, please know that you're not alone. It feels awful. It feels shameful, but it helps to speak about it. And when we speak to each other, you know, 
when I listened to these women, I was healed. It put my own terrible experiences in perspective. But for all of us, find the courage that when you see something bad happening to someone else, say something. And if you can do something about it, it's sort of what John Lewis has told us all about structural racism. We will all benefit from telling the truth about the day-to-day -day realities of gender and academic medicine. Although my daughter is many, many years younger than I, and she's a medical student now, and I was a medical student so many years ago, it is startling to me how some of her gender-related experiences have persisted from all those many years ago, despite an increasing awareness. So this is who they are today. Uh, this is, uh, we were in South Africa just before Anna started medical school. And I just wanna conclude by uh, saying that without these people, I wouldn't be here today. Take advantage of the people who love you. They are there to help you when you fall on hard times. And I wanna close finally by reminding all of us why it matters that we care about this. Yes, we wanna protect people from suffering. Yes, we wanna right injustice. But if we continue to force women out of academic medicine for inexplicable reasons, the world will be a far worse place. This article appeared in the New York Times uh, less than a month ago. And the story was about her foundational work on mRNA vaccines and how without the work of this investigator at the University of Pennsylvania, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines would have been impossible. But hidden behind the words of the New York Times article was the fact that she was treated terribly. She was on the research track. She could never get onto the tenure track. She depended on the kindness of senior male faculty to take her into their labs to allow her to do her work. She had no startup package. She had limited resources. Her grants were not funded. So this is the price. If we lose people like Dr. Carrico and all the women who feel so undervalued, the world will be less healthy than it could be. So thank you so much for uh, uh, having me here today. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I really appreciate you giving me an opportunity to speak for the first time in a public venue about the work that we're doing. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for sharing this work. Um, you know, I'm from a different field. I'm from the social sciences and economics, but some of the stories that the clinicians shared with you um, very much align with stories that I experienced over the years as a student and as a um, early stage researcher and some of the things that I try to do as a mentor myself. And I, I think many in the audience have had that um, experience of trying to rectify these longstanding um, issues. We have a number of great questions that have come into the Q&A. So I will start um, with one from Justin White, who is one of our faculty members. And he asked um, what your thoughts are on the double bind faced by women of color and to what degree racial and ethnic differences may also be a component in the gender gap in submitting R01s, um, salary issues, promotion, and, and so on. Thank you, Justin. That's a really important question. Um, you know, one of the limitations of the study is that I really did not um, prioritize uh, diversity of uh, race and ethnicity when identifying subjects, although I did happen to interview uh, some women who were uh, of uh, Hispanic and some women who were African American. And each time I did this, I asked them if they could distinguish their experiences as a woman versus their experiences as a minority. And it surprised me each and every time that they felt that being a woman was a far greater liability for them in science or medicine than being a minority. And I know it's difficult. I mean, maybe one of the more uh, um, 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 illustrative examples is, you know, I'm often confused for a nurse when I'm in the hospital, as, as many women who, uh, who are medical students or, or are uh, a faculty, but I've never been confused for a housekeeper. And the African American MDs that I met with said that if they don't put their white coat on when they're when they leave their office, they are often mistaken for housekeepers. So that certainly uh, um, uh, suggests to us the different kinds of experiences that they are uh, subjected to. Thanks for that. 
Great. Um, so uh, Rebecca Smith Bindman, who also you may know is on our faculty, um, she raises the question about the NIH awards being proportional to application submissions. And she puts forward a hypothesis that I also would have put forward that the lower rates of submissions coming from women might suggest or might lead to the potential that the applications coming from women are quite frankly somewhat stronger because you have fewer coming in, but but um, you know they have to rise to the top, as it were. So you know, do, and she notes that she's observed on study sections some of the same kinds of things about you know, well, the men have leadership and the women are just experts, or you know, different language there. Um, any any thoughts about accounting for this or or how to address this, and whether we're letting NIH off the hook by saying, oh, well, the problem is really in the application process or the early stage of the application development and not in the review and the assessment of the applications. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, Rebecca, I can't see you, but thanks for the question. Um, I think you're absolutely right. You know, I think that um, what I'm finding is that the NIH is, um, determined to do something about this. So please get in touch with me. Now, I, I because I, I'm, um, I have a consulting relationship with them, I'm able to get access to data and be in rooms and serving on a gender committee there. So I'd love people to reach out to me. Let's talk about ideas as to what NIH can do a better job. So I don't mean, mean to let the NIH off the hook completely. I think it's a pervasive problem, um, but I also, um, do think that there's right now no apparent accountability for institutions uh, um, essentially supporting far more applications from their male faculty than their female faculty. So I think that both are true and I would really appreciate any kind of uh, ideas people have about how I can help NIH address this because they care about it. They just have to be very careful about the, uh, the optics of what, what they do. Great. Um, Janet Kaufman, um, who is also on our faculty, uh, was interested in hearing more about women's experiences with female mentors, um, as well as, um, you know, I, I would add comparisons with male mentors, perhaps. Um, you know, did, did, did you see anything systematic about the gender of the mentor that the person you interviewed had experienced, whether and how those different mentorship relationships across gender um, and within gender may be important? Yeah, really good question, Janet. So I don't feel like we have the kind of data that allows me to draw anything conclusive from it. The vast majority of mentors for both men and women were men, uh, particularly for the older, because remember I prioritized a senior faculty. And so back in the day, there were very few women who were available to be mentors. But everybody I interviewed was a mentor. And uh, one of the hypotheses that I had going in was, are women harder on other women? And I explored that um, in every interview. I asked the men what they saw. I asked the women what they experienced. And what I would say is I found no evidence for it. What I really found was women expect um, um, a, um, a more maybe of an intimate friendship uh, with other women. And when they aren't, when that, when that doesn't come to pass, it feels particularly painful, where they may have very different uh, expectations of uh, their male, male mentors or male mentees. Great. So we'll take one last question that I have here that I, I think is very important and a great closing. Um, Mara Decker asked, uh, well, first she complimented the presentation as everybody has, um, but she asked, um, you know, that you spoke a lot about individual responses and the importance of the individual things that mentors can do. Um, and you mentioned, or you said a few had mentioned policy. So what are some policies that you think could help address some of the stresses? One of the ones that Mara notes that you highlighted is that a lot of people seem to have brought up the effect of having children on their career trajectories and the family responsibilities associated with that. Um, you know, are there policy solutions that you would recommend that go beyond the importance of the mentorship and the championing of women in the field? Yeah, what I would say was most illuminating is that when, and I'm old enough to remember that when the, uh, the tenure clock modification policies were first introduced and tailored to women, nobody took advantage of them because we didn't want to be labeled as weaker. And so with time, and I think in, in particular at the University of California, I think they were always gender neutral. 
And so what has happened every time, and I think we're seeing this with COVID as well, is that once a policy is gender neutral and the resources are limited and men take advantage of it as well as women, it ends up not helping women necessarily. For example, one of my interviewees had a young child and his wife and young child moved to a different city for her fellowship. And there was a, there was a resource at his institution to apply for funding. Um, and it, it had to do with young children and childcare. And so he took advantage of it. <laughs> so here was a, a limited resource that really was designed to help women with primary childcare responsibilities, but it wasn't necessarily, uh, um, women weren't necessarily prioritized to receive that resource. So I actually think the policies themselves aren't the problem, it's the application of the policies. And it's the failure to understand the reality that for most families, uh, particularly families with children, even with the most enlightened spouse, women do the lion's share of both childcare management and home management. And I think until we reckon with that as a society, and it's really refreshing to see the Biden infrastructure bill really start to speak about that, it's really hard for me to imagine that any single policy in academic medicine is going to be effectively effective at addressing it. Great. Well, that maybe was a somewhat depressing note to end on. No, I don't mean that. Um, but I, you know, I, I really appreciate the research that you've done. It is an incredible set of stories and the analysis and bringing it together and the themes that you identified, I think, resonate with many and also will illuminate many. So thank you so much for being here. I want to let everybody know that on June 9th, we have the Chancellor's Health Policy Lecture. Um, and that is Alice Chen, who is the Chief Medical Officer of Covered California. She is also close to the UCSF family. We are very excited to have her for this, um, you know, one of our major events of the year at UCSF. And then the next Grand Rounds will be on July 21st. And we have Tomas Aragon, who is the State Public Health Officer since January and the Director of the California um, Department of Public Health. So the next two grand rounds are really going to be rich into California policy issues and include um, some really fabulous leaders in the field. So thank you, everybody, for joining us this month. And thank you, Dr. Grandis, for sharing this research with us.